Today we're going to speak on the subject of the power of praise and worship. The power of praise and worship. Now, as we go into this message, a lot of you will just think that what we do up here on Sunday mornings is just a formality that, you know, every church goes through, you know, some praise and worship programs are better than other praise and worship programs. You know, I've been in every kind of church you can imagine. I've been in them where the singing is terrible, and I've been in the ones where the singing is good. And uh, one thing I have learned is that it doesn't have to be good in order for you to praise and worship. It doesn't have to be professional. There doesn't have to be fog machines and laser light shows and everything else that the modern day church is bringing in. That is not part of worship. That is part of stirring up emotions. And I'm very, very careful of that when it comes to worship. Most of you know my history. I started off being a worship leader for many, about 15 years. Um, and the Lord called me to be a teaching pastor. And then for the last three years, I've kind of organized this crew up here and, and uh, tried to bring out the best in them. And, and they bring out the best in me as well. Uh, sometimes they bring out the worst in me. Would you all agree with that? Uh, Rick Denson said, he knows when I'm frustrated when I back off and I start rubbing my head like this. He's, he's like, oh, I know something's wrong at that point. Um, I am very passionate about worship. I am very passionate about worship being biblical. I am very passionate about worship, even the lyrics in it being biblical. Because I'm going to tell you, there's a lot of stuff playing on the modern day radio, called, quote, quote, Christian radios that is not biblical. There's a lot of it out there. And, and I find Christian people who have been in the Word for a long period of time just mindlessly singing those songs, okay? And they just sing along with, do you know it's just as wrong to sing a lie as it is to tell a lie? It is, okay? Um, I, I'm going to tell you one of my pet peeve songs that, uh, that uh, every time I hear it, I go into, I, I just kind of go into, oh my Lord. How many Christian people are singing this song? And I guarantee you most of you will know this song. It's called uh, The Reckless Love of God. Okay? Y'all know the song I'm talking about. If you do, shake your head. Yes. I've heard that song before. Matter of fact, you might have even been guilty of singing that song before. I want to tell you this. There is absolutely zero that's reckless about the love of God. It is very intentional very intentional. He stepped down from his throne in heaven before the foundation of the world, before this place was spoken into existence. It was already foreordained that he would love the, the world so much that he would send his only begotten son. And Jesus intentionally stepped down from the very throne of heaven, became a child born of a virgin named Mary, bled, suffered, died, and rose again on the third day. And I'm telling you, there's nothing reckless about that. Nothing. It is intentional. So these are the sorts of things that I always try to be very careful of because when we praise and worship the Lord, we need to praise and worship Him in spirit and in truth. That's what the Word of God says. All right? So let's begin this message today from Psalm chapter 100. We'll begin in verse number 1. Make a joyful noise unto the Lord, all ye lands. Serve the Lord with gladness. Come before His presence with singing. Know you that the Lord, He is God. It is He that hath made us, not we ourselves. We are His people and the sheep of His pasture. Enter into His gates with thanksgiving and into His courts with praise. Be thankful unto Him and bless His name. For the Lord is good, His mercy is everlasting, and His truth endureth to all generations. Now, I used this passage of Scripture back a few weeks ago in the sermon that I titled it as a good thing to praise the Lord. Today, I want to talk to you about why we should praise the Lord. There is a lot of power when we praise and we worship the Lord. And uh, it, it's always interesting to me that when a worship service starts, uh, you know, I, I usually try to start with something that everybody knows to kind of get everybody into the singing mode. You know, like this morning, we started off with Amazing Grace. And, and 
you know, I can't imagine anybody in the world that doesn't know the song Amazing Grace, but a lot of people do not know it. I'm coming to realize that. Um, so we try to start off with something that gets everybody singing. Then as we get in a little bit further in there, I will bring in uh, some, uh, the praise team will bring in some newer stuff that you may or may not know. But one thing that I've noticed, we might sing a song one time, and as I scan the auditorium, there might be several people standing there not singing. But after we use it a time or two, and the praise team will tell you this, now you look out and everybody begins singing it. Why? Because there is power in praise. And when you enter into his gates with thanksgiving and into his courts with praise, that brings a power about in your life. Now, unfortunately, uh, many Christians in our culture today have become traditionalist in what we say. I mean, something happens in our life. One of our common sayings that we may throw out, oh, thank God for that, or oh, praise the Lord. And we say that, we become traditional, and it's become a programmed response to us. But we really don't mean it. We really don't stop and give the Lord thanks. We just say it. I think sometimes it's just so we sound like we're saying something spiritual. You know, but we really don't mean it, you know. Or, or we may say, Lord, help me here. And you don't really mean it. Uh, teenagers, when I was a youth pastor years ago, teenagers would pray on exam week more than they ever prayed. And they would say, Lord, help me to pass this test. When, and, and I always told them the same thing. You know, if the Lord was speaking back at you in a voice you could hear, what you would hear is, you should have studied. <laughs> you know, we, we ask the Lord to help us, but we really, don't, we really don't mean a lot of that. And when we say, oh, thank God, a lot of times we really don't mean that. I mean, for heaven's sake, we have a lot of Christian people, and, and I'm using that term, we have a lot of Christian people and probably some sitting in here, that when you sit down before you eat, you don't even give thanks to the Lord for the food you're about to eat. Let me tell you something. You go out to eat with me, I don't care where we're at. It makes no difference to me. I'm going to reach across that table and you're going to grab my hand or you're going to say, no, I'm not touching you. I'm going to reach and grab your hand and we're going to pray right there at that table. Amen? Because I'm thankful for the food I get. And I'm just going to tell you, it, it's not this way everywhere. Maybe if you lived in some of these malnourished po uh, uh, poverty areas, countries where they don't have food enough to eat and they don't have nutrition enough to keep them, maybe then you would be thankful for the blessings that we have. Amen? Amen. So don't use catchphrases like, oh, thank God, and they really don't mean it, or praise the Lord, or Lord, help me. Don't use those if it's just a programmed response. Why? Because anytime we use the Lord's name, it should be a heartfelt gratitude or prayer. That's part of not taking the Lord's name in vain, okay? Some of you think the only way you take the Lord's name is vain, in vain is if you attach the D word after it, but that is not the case. I submit to you this morning, every time you say, oh my God, you are taking the Lord's name in vain. Because at that point, you are not giving him praise, you are not giving him worship, you are not recognizing his deity and his superiority over who we are. And you got to be careful even when you text him because OMG means what? You know what it means. Be careful that you're not using the Lord's name in vain. It ought to be something that we revere. It ought to be a name that we look at as being holy. So what is the power of praise and worship? Number one, why should we worship? Well, he is worthy of our praise. He is worthy of of our praise. Do you understand that? Psalm chapter 18, verse number 3, the first part of that verse says, I will call upon the Lord who is worthy to be praised. Read it out loud with me. I will call upon the Lord who is worthy to be praised. Say it again. I will call upon the Lord who is worthy to be praised. And you know what? We need to get up tomorrow morning on Monday when you feel like, oh, the whole world has caved in on me. It's been too much weekend. I've went too much. I'm tired. I'm wore out. I wish I could just stay home today. And you need to wake up in the morning and say, I will call upon the Lord who is worthy to be praised. We need to be that 
people. Revelation chapter 5, beginning in verse number 11. Here's what John wrote, inspired by the Holy Spirit. Then I looked and heard the voice of many angels around the throne, the living creatures and the elders, and the number of them was 10,000 times 10,000 and thousands of thousands, saying with a loud voice, Worthy is the Lamb who was slain to receive power and riches and wisdom and strength and honor and glory and blessing. Look, even the angels praise. So we as God's children, especially those who are saved, especially those who are of the household of faith, you've been changed by the blood of Jesus. You've been sanctified. You've been redeemed from this sinful life into a life of following Jesus. He has chosen you to bless you in ways you cannot imagine. We need to be singing forth the praises of God because He's worthy to be praised. Amen? Look, we worship God because of who He is. We praise God because of what He's done. And we give thanks to God because what He has done for you. That's why we give thanks. Look, Thanksgiving is one of my favorite holidays. I'm a guy, I love the holiday season. I'm just going to tell you right up now. I love it. I love Thanksgiving and I love Christmas. Man, that's two of my favorite. Number one, I am thankful in November, not only for the country that we live in, the freedoms that we have to be able to worship the Lord in spirit and truth. I'm thankful for that. And I'm thankful for the parents who raised me. And I'm thankful that I live in South Louisiana. Amen? Amen. I am. Not necessarily so much in June, July, August, and September because it's so hot. But I'm thankful to live here the rest of the year. And by Thanksgiving, I'm definitely thankful to be here. But I'm thankful to be a child of God. I'm thankful that he chose to save me. He chose to bring me out of the mire that I was trapped in. And uh, I told somebody one time, he brought me out of the mire and put me in the choir. And I'm thankful for that. And I, I thank him all the time for what he's done in my life. I'm thankful that he gave me the greatest wife on the face of the earth. You didn't get the greatest wife. I did. And I'm thankful for that. But then comes Christmas, man. What a joy it is. And if you've been around me very much, I love the sounds of the season. I do. I love Christmas music. Look, starting the day after Thanksgiving, I'll be out working around in my shop doing little wood projects here and there, and I've got on Christmas music already because I love that. But I really love the fact that we celebrate Jesus' birth. I love that. And there's not a day that goes by in the Christmas season that I'm not thankful that Jesus Christ chose to step down from heaven and to become a man and to suffer and die, pay the price, but yet be resurrected on the third day. I am thankful for that. See, the Christmas story to me is the whole thing. That's the whole thing. And I'm thankful for that. Somebody wrote, and I don't know who this was. I just bring it to you this morning. Praise and thanksgiving is verbalized faith. If you thank God after the fact, that's called gratitude. If you thank God before it happens, that's called faith. We need to be people who are constantly thanking God and walking in faith. As a matter of fact, the writer of Hebrews says, for without faith it is impossible to please God. We need to be that people. So not only is he worthy of our praise and worship, we are called to praise and worship. We are called to praise God. As Christian people, that is our duty. That is our responsibility. 1 Peter chapter 2, verse number 9 says this, But you are a chosen generation, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, his own special people, that you may proclaim the praises of him who called you out of darkness into his marvelous light. The King James Version of that says, For you are a chosen generation, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, get this, a peculiar people, that you should show forth the praises of him who has called you out of darkness into his marvelous light. I like what the King James says. We are a peculiar people. Listen, I'm a weirdo, and I don't mind telling you I'm a weirdo. I have people tell me a lot of times, well, you're a nut. Well, thank God I'm screwed on to the right bolt. I don't mind being a nut. I don't mind being a weirdo for Jesus. Because I love him, and I'm thankful, and I am not going to stop praising him. I am not going to stop proclaiming. 
because he is worthy of our praise. We are called to worship God in spirit and in truth. Psalm chapter 150, verse number 6 says this, Let everything that has breath praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. He, he said it twice. Let everything that has breath praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. The writer of Psalms knew what it meant to praise. And we need to be that people. We need to be the people that are not afraid to praise the Lord. We need to be people that when we're walking through the valley of the shadow of death, we're giving God praise in spite of it. We're giving God praise. Listen, after all, that's what leads you through the storm. We were made for praise. You ever thought about that? When the Lord created me anew, now he created me in 1964, December of 1964, he created me a, a little baby. I, well, not a little baby. I've never been little. But he created me. I was born in Slidell Memorial Hospital on December 10th, 1964. But he recreated me on July the 19th, 1984, at the age of 19 and a half years old. And when he created me, I was not the same person that I was created to be in 1964. I was a different guy. And when the Lord came into my life, he changed every part of me. Now, that doesn't mean my flesh nature doesn't struggle with my spirit nature, because it does. But he placed within me his spirit. We talked about that last week, becoming a dwelling place for God. He placed his spirit within me and he created me anew so that those things that I used to do, I no longer did. Paul wrote in 2 Corinthians 5, 17, if any man is in Christ, he is a new creation. Behold, old things have passed away and all things have become new. Listen, we have reason to praise God. I have reason to praise God that I'm not the same man that I was. I was made for praise, and I'm going to tell you, I can't be quiet about it. You find me out working in my shop. Sometimes you find me in the shower. You find, Don't come find me in the shower. I'm only kidding. But uh, you will hear me singing. Why? Because I was made for praise. I was made to give God honor and glory. And I'm going to do it whether I'm on key, off key, whatever. I'm going to praise God. And that's the way we were created. And we need to do that. We need to be praising the Lord. We were talking about on stage this morning during our pre-service warm-up about how wonderful you guys sound when you're singing out here. And I'm going to, did we have that conversation? We did have that conversation this morning. And look, I'm going to tell you, you talk about encouraging. When this team is up here leading you in worship and you're responding and you're singing, look, uh, if you watch Mike Gerstner, and he'll be back with us in a couple of weeks. He, get, he got COVID. Uh, Tuesday will be two weeks ago, but this past week his wife got diagnosed with COVID, and now their nine-year-old may have it. So anyway, he'll be back with us in a few weeks. But he plays with headphones on, all right, because mainly what he's concerned about hearing is the other instrumentalist. Now, I'm different than that. I play, I took a, a set of really nice headphones, and I cut one of the headphones all the way off of it. So I only have one, and I stick it in my left ear. And so I can monitor the rest of the group to make sure that when I'm playing drums, I can hear them and make sure we're all on, on the same page together. I can hear some of the harmonies that are being sung. But the other ear is open because I like hearing y'all. And that's the truth. I love to hear y'all singing. Sometimes we'll just cut the instruments and we sing a cappella. And I'm going to tell you, I can hear you singing. And it is so encouraging to this old pastor. Why? Because we were made for praise. We need to do it. And I'm going to tell you this. If you can't praise the Lord inside of his church auditorium, you aren't going to do it out there in public. If you can't do it here where you are surrounded by believers, you're going to struggle to do it out there. Number three, praise and worship changes us. It changes us. Now, I'm going to give you some things you may not have ever thought about before, but I want you to think about it today. A constant focus on the negative can obscure many of the joys of life. It can dampen an attitude of gratitude. What can? Our constant focus on the negative. It will dampen 
our attitude of gratitude, and I'm going to tell you, it will be, say that with me, will be, will be a drain on everybody around you. A negative outlook, a negative attitude will drain the life out of everybody around you. If you have trouble having friends want to come over to your house, if you have trouble having friends want to go out to eat with you, if you have trouble keeping friends, start looking. Do I, am I always negative about stuff? Because I guarantee if you're negative about stuff, not many people is going to want to hang out with you very long because you'll just suck the life right out of them. If you're negative and you ask me to go out to eat, I might go out with you once. And when you ask me the second time, I might say, okay, listen, we're not talking about problems tonight. Let's just go and focus on the good thing. Because I'm going to tell you, you can get so focused on negative stuff that it not only sucks the life out of people around you, it sucks the life out of you. I've shared this with you a couple of times in the last eight months now. I had to turn the news off. I did. I had to turn it off because it was sucking the life out of me, man. I was sitting in my recliner watching the news, and I used to watch it all the time. And I found myself just wanting to give up, wanting to say, ah, all is bad. The whole world's going to hell in a handbasket. Why should I care? And that's not what God called me to do. God called me to care. God called you to care. So sometimes we have to rid ourselves of the negative around us. Counting your blessings instead of counting your losses will do great things in your life. Focusing on the things that you have instead of the things that you don't have. Look, I got caught up in that for a while. I uh, uh, had friends who had boats and stuff, and I kind of got a little mealy mouth. And here I am with four daughters at home, and I want to be able to go and take them to the river and want to go do all this and that. And, and so uh, I made a way. I made a way. Notice I didn't say God made a way. I made a way, and I went and bought me a boat. I did. I got it. And we enjoyed that boat for a little while until I started having a little issue with it. And so I went and, and got it checked out, and, and come to find out, I bought a boat that the entire transom on the back was completely rotted out. It was a 17-foot bass boat. Could I repair it? I could have. Did I want to? No. So I offloaded that boat. Well, then I just got to have another one because, after all, all my friends have one. So I went and bought me a 22-foot Stratus with a 225, uh, what was that, an Evinrude on it? And, man, I was in hog heaven. I enjoyed it. I had, you know, every... And, and I come to notice something. Every time... We did a ski day. I would put $125 worth of fuel in that thing, and everybody else would have a lot of fun and then go home. Cost me $125. I had to go home and clean up the boat. Joe, you with me? You, you got? I'd have to go home and clean up all the mess, and every year I'm the one who put a thousand in May. That's what boat stands for, by the way, break out another thousand. Um, <laughs> that, that's the acronym for boat. And, and I just come to realize this is... I thought what would bring me joy really became an anchor, and it bothered me. And I found myself focusing on what I didn't have versus what I did have. Now, I'm going to tell you, the two greatest days of my life was when I bought the boat and when I sold the boat. That was the greatest days of my life, okay? Now, if you have a boat and you like it, go for it. That wasn't my cup of tea. I thought maybe I could get into fishing again. Drove an hour and a half down to Breton Sound, man. Put in, the, put in the thing. Had put about $150 worth of fuel in there. We went out about 20 miles into the swamp, into the marshy area, because the reds and the specks were hitting hard out there, and a buddy of mine was leading me in the boat. We got out there, and um, we, we stopped, and I put the trolling motor in, and when I put the trolling motor in, all the gnats in that entire marsh said, look, a fat guy. <laughs> and dude, I'm going to tell you what. 
I couldn't even breathe without sucking them down my esophagus. It was so bad. And my daughter was about 15 years old. I was looking forward to a great day of fishing with her. She's up there miserable. I threw out one time and reeled back in. She threw out one time and reeled back in. And she said, Dad, I can't stand this. And I said, me neither, babe. Put your, put your rod up. We put the uh, trolling motor back in the boat, and I waved to my friend. I said, we're out, dude. I rode 20 miles back to the landing, put it back on the trailer, and never took it back off again. Enough was enough. I hate nets. <laughs> hate them. You know, we get to focusing on what we don't have versus what we do have. You with me? We can't be like that as God's children. Because the truth is, everything you have is a blessing from God. If you don't believe that, go spend a week with the homeless community that lives in New Orleans. Go down there and hang out with them for about a week. You'll go home appreciating everything you have. You really want to appreciate it? Go to Mexico on a mission trip. Go to Mexico on a mission trip. I, I highly, highly advise you do that. Because if you're like I am, the three times I've been into Mexico on different uh, mission trips and different reasons, when I drive back across the border, I almost feel guilty that I'm riding in a classy vehicle and I'm going home to a house that's classy and has air conditioning in it. It almost makes me feel guilty. It makes me appreciate what I have. See, sometimes we have to get out of our little high-maintenance bubble and get into something else so we learn to appreciate what we have. You with me? Praise and worship changes us. We read this earlier, but I want to remind you of something that I preached last week, which was creating a dwelling place for God. Here's what I'm going to tell you. The Holy Spirit absolutely, positively will not work in your life if you're always focusing on what you don't have instead of thanking Him for what you do have. Let me remind you of what we read earlier. Chapter 100, verse number 4. Enter into his gates with and into his courts with. That means when you're ready to go into the presence of God, when you're ready to enter into his presence, you're going to do so with thanksgiving and praise. That's the way you enter into his gates with thanksgiving and into his courts with praise. You want to create that dwelling place for God to live in your life, that for the Holy Spirit, a, a habitable habitation in your life. Man, it's going to happen because you thank God and you praise God. Don't make the Holy Spirit live in a cluttered up, junked up, nasty, filthy place. If you didn't catch that message, go back. It's online. You can catch it from last week. Hebrews chapter 13, verse number 15 says, Through him... Then let us continually offer up a sacrifice of praise to God. That is the fruit of lips that gives thanks to His name. A sacrifice of praise. You ever thought about that? What is a sacrifice? A sacrifice is you're giving up something for someone else. That's what a sacrifice is. The American soldier have all given up their, their way of life in a sacrifice to be able to help the rest of us to remain free. Some of them have paid the ultimate price in their sacrifice. They literally give their lives for our freedom. Some of them have went through divorce because of their sacrifice of their time and their, their family just didn't want to deal with it anymore. It's very real. When we give a sacrifice, a lot of you... Um, a lot of you when, you, when the offering basket is passed, if you drop that $5 in, you may not have $5 to give, but that's a sacrifice if you drop it in. Or some of you drop in 100 or however much that might be. You may not necessarily have that, but it's a sacrifice unto the Lord. When we sing, some of you don't know how to sing. No, I'm, and I'm being honest. Some of you don't know how to sing. You, you weren't brought up in a singing house. You weren't brought up in a church that sang. You weren't uh, brought up in a school that had music education in that school. And you never really learned how to sing. Okay? And then some of you did learn how to sing, but you can't sing. All right? There are, there's an abundance of everybody. It's there. And I don't take any of it for granted. 
You know, uh, you hear me say this all the time. Not everybody belongs up here singing on Sunday. If all of you could sing and you were all up here, who would we be leading in worship? You see what I'm saying? So not everybody is designed to sing up here, but everybody is designed for praise. Everybody is. So you sing out and you make a joyful noise unto the Lord. Even when you don't feel like it, you sacrifice the praise because it will change you. It will change you. I guarantee you, you're not going to be down and defeated and sing in victory in Jesus. It ain't going to happen. You will change when you begin singing the praises of God. Dr. Miles Monroe wrote this, and I brought it to you this morning. I want to give it to you. The sacrifice of praise won't cost you any money, but it will cost you your self-centeredness and your natural tendency to dwell on whatever is wrong in your life. Giving God your sacrifice of praise means that you choose to dwell on Him instead of yourself. Isn't that good? It's not going to cost you anything except your self-centeredness. Because when you begin praising God, you can't focus on your problems. Have you ever noticed that when you hate somebody and you begin praying for them, that hate begins diminishing? If you don't believe that, try it sometimes. Try it sometimes. That person who has offended you so deeply, begin praying daily for them. Pray that God would somehow move into their life and, and, and change who they are and put them on a new road and, and pray that uh, even if God uses you to do it, that you would be a willing vessel to be able to do that. You begin praying for them daily and I promise you it won't be long till all of that animosity in your life will be gone. I promise you that. Some of you may need to begin praying for that ex-spouse that God would touch their heart and that God would do something in their life. Maybe some of you need to begin praying for a mom or dad who said or did something that offended you or harmed you in some way. Begin praying that God would do that. And let me tell you, if they're already dead and gone, you still pray and ask God to change your heart toward them. You pray. And I promise you, when you begin acknowledging God and you begin lifting Him up, He will change things in your life. Isaiah chapter 61, beginning in verse number 1. The Spirit of the Sovereign Lord is upon me. This is Isaiah writing. For the Lord has anointed me to bring good news to the poor. He has sent me to comfort the brokenhearted and to proclaim that captives will be released and prisoners will be freed. Now slide to verse number 3. He will give a crown of beauty for ashes, a joyous blessing instead of mourning, festive praise instead of despair. In their righteousness, they will be like great oaks that the Lord has planted for His own glory. I learned a song when I was a kid. Some of you may have heard this song before. Put on the garment of praise for the spirit of heaviness. That's taken directly from this verse. Sometimes when you're down in despair and you're distressed and you're depressed, we need to throw that off and put on the spirit of praise. We need to put on the spirit of praise and you praise him. What's that song I quoted for you a couple of weeks ago? You praise him in the storm and watch how he changes things in your life. You have to do this. This is important. You begin focusing on God instead of your losses or your depression or your anything else, you don't focus on that. Every now and then I counsel people who are depressed and they're going through some really rough times. And I've, I found out some things, and, and there again, I am a biblical counselor. I'm not a psychological counselor. So there's two different ball games there. But I found out a few things. When a person gets down and depressed, they go in their house and a lot of them close their blinds, they close their curtains, and they just want to be in the darkness. They just want to be by themselves and left alone. That is what depression, when it gets to a certain degree, looks like. And my advice for them has always been, man, pull them curtains open. Open them blinds and let the sun shine in. And then get yourself out in the yard and get you some vitamin D. Get it from the sun because I promise you it will change things. 
How many of you know that exposure to the sun makes you feel better? Now, I'm going to tell you as Christian people, exposure to the S-O-N makes you feel better. And you've got to get into a place to where you're not focused on yourself any longer. You are focused on God. Don't wait for things to get good to begin praising Him. You begin praising Him and watch how He makes things get better. That's the only way it can be. And last, praise defeats our enemy. Praise defeats our enemy. I'm going to read you a fairly long passage of Scripture this morning from 2 Chronicles. And I'm going to tell you, 2 Chronicles chapter 20. This, without a doubt, hands down, out of every passage of Scripture in the Bible, this is my favorite. I love this story. I, I love this story. Now, uh, don't read anything into it. I love God so loved the world. I love, I love all those passages of Scripture. But this passage of Scripture has spoke to me more in my life, especially as a worship leader. This passage of Scripture spoke to me more than any passage I have ever used in my life. We're going to begin reading in chapter 20 in verse number 15. Listen, all you people of Judah and Jerusalem. Listen, King Jehoshaphat. This is what the Lord says. Do not be afraid. Do not be discouraged by this mighty army. For the battle is not yours, but God's. Now hang on a second. What had happened was there was four different countries, at least four, that came together to do battle against Judah. And they, this was a massive army. These armies did not like each other at all, but you know the old saying, the, the enemy of my enemy is my friend. And so they all came together, and they decided they were all going to put all their forces in one basket. It would be kind of like the United States, Russia, and China coming together to do battle against Israel. Okay? You're talking about a massive army going against a little nation that's about the size of the peninsula of Florida. Okay? You get in the whole picture here now, okay? Verse 16. Tomorrow, march out against them. You will find them coming up through the ascent of Ziz at the end of the valley that opens into the wilderness of Jeruel. But you will not even need to fight. Take your positions then stand still and watch the Lord's victory. He is with you, O people of Judah and Jerusalem. Do not be afraid or discouraged. Go out against them tomorrow, for the Lord is with you. Everybody get in the picture here. He said, don't be afraid of United States, Russia, and China, little Israel. Just go out against them and watch what I do. I'm just giving you a, a picture of what goes on. Verse number 20. Early the next morning, the army of Judah went out into the wilderness of Tekoa. On the way, Jehoshaphat stopped and said, Listen to me, all you people of Judah and Jerusalem. Believe in the Lord your God, and you will be able to stand firm. Believe in His prophets, and you will succeed. After consulting the people, the king appointed singers to walk ahead of the army, singing to the Lord and praising Him for His holy splendor. This is what they sang. Give thanks to the Lord. His faithful love endures forever. Michael W. Smith wrote a song based on that. Um, give thanks to the Lord, our God and King. His love endures forever. A lot of you have heard that. I love that song. It's a good one. Based off of this scripture right here, verse 22. At the very moment they began to sing and give praise, the Lord caused the armies of Ammon, Moab, and Mount Seir to start fighting among themselves. The armies of Moab and Ammon turned against their allies from Mount Seir and killed every one of them. After they had destroyed the army of Seir, they began attacking each other. So when the army of Judah arrived at the lookout point in the wilderness, all they saw were dead bodies lying on the, on the ground as far as they could see. Not a single one of the enemy had escaped. King Jehoshaphat and his men went out to gather the plunder. They found vast amounts of equipment, clothing, and other valuables, more than they could carry. 
There was so much plunder that it took them three days just to collect it all. Now, I want to give you that picture for a moment. Okay? Imagine taking our praise team and putting them in front of the United States military going against Russia and China. Casey and, and, and Sayward and Nikki and uh, Byron and um, uh, I'm, my blank, um, Rick and, and Cammie and Andrew and John and, and all the other ones that are up here, taking them, putting them right on the front line. And Mandy, I didn't mean to miss Mandy. Putting them right in front of the Marine infantry and saying, okay, we're going up against Russia and China. So what I want y'all to do is get out front and just start singing. Now, how idiotic does that sound? It sounds pretty idiotic, doesn't it? It sounds completely illogical that you would put the praise team right in front of the army. But that is exactly what they did. Why? Because they knew that praising God brought power and defeat against their enemy. And that's what they did. That is exactly what they did. And you know what? <clears throat> Every Sunday morning, that's what we do. Here. Every Sunday morning. This praise team comes out here. We play a little bit of music to kind of get everything started. Then the singers will join on stage and begin singing. And you know what we're doing? We're beginning and we're engaging in battle with Satan. Why? Because God only knows what you brought in here with you. What kind of arguments you had on the way to church this morning. How much you had to fight with your kids to get up and get dressed. Or maybe your spouse. They didn't want to go today and you wanted them to go. And Lord only knows what happened yesterday or at work last week and you're still carrying that. Or maybe you and your wife got in a fight last night and, and you hate her guts this morning. And you brought all that into the auditorium. Amen? So what we do is we put our praise team on the front line. And we start saying, okay, we know that most people do not arrive in a spirit-filled mood. Most people arrive, and especially those of you who come late, you probably done drove like Speedy Gonzalez to get here. And if you're like me, I get... Deeply stressed out when I'm late. Deeply stressed out. And, and you come in, and now we need to move you from where you're at to where God wants you so he can speak into your life. That's why we praise. That's why we worship. That's why we pray. Because we're trying to drive the enemy away so that the Spirit of God can move in your life through his preached word. So that's exactly what we do every Sunday. The praise team is on the front line. That's why we have rehearsal during the week. The praise team is usually here somewhere around two and a half hours every Thursday night working on music. They're here at least an hour and a half before every service going through it, making sure everything is good. And, and the reason we do that is because, number one, and I tell them this all the time, we can't lead the people where we aren't ourselves already. And sometimes we have people walk on stage, and you can tell it when they walk on stage to practice on Sunday morning, they are deeply troubled and deeply burdened by something. And what we do most of the time, we'll stop and pray for them. And if it's still stressing them out, when we gather back here at 9.45, 15 minutes before the service starts, we get back there and we have prayer sessions right back here. And we pray and ask God to remove anything because we realize we can't lead people to where we aren't already ourselves. And I'm going to tell you, there's power in praise. It defeats our enemy. It changes who we are. It, it's so instrumental in our life. We're called to praise and worship. And be, why? Because he is worthy of our praise. And we need to be those people. Have you been fighting the same old battle over and over 
and over again. It's amazing to me when I talk to people. They've been dealing with struggles all of their life. Some people are hung in a constant cycle of drug abuse. Some people are hung in a constant cycle of alcohol abuse. Some people are hung in a constant cycle of lust and adultery. And they want to change. They really want to change. But they never do. They end up right back in the same old problem again. It's just cyclical right back over and over again. The problem is you're trying to accomplish it the same way every time. Sooner or later, you have to make the decision that my way of trying to handle this does not work. I need to try things a different way. And what you need to do is put praise on the front line of that battle. You need to begin singing out to God even if you can't sing. You need to begin quoting scriptures. And if you don't know scriptures, just open the Word and begin reading the scriptures. And I highly recommend, go to the book of Psalms, man. Just start reading them out loud. You begin praising God and you watch the devil leave you. Because Satan cannot exist where the praises of God are being exalted. It cannot happen. That's as crazy as thinking darkness and light can coexist. It does not happen. Even if it's the tiniest flicker of light, it will overtake the darkness that is right there in that area. Light always overcomes darkness. When you begin praising, you're shining light of Christ in your life. You're shining the light of Christ around you, and Satan is going to get very uncomfortable with that. That's good. Make that sucker uncomfortable and drive him away. Amen? We need to try this. Because there is power in praise and worship. There's power there. And I'm, I'm praying, I am hoping and praying that this message will seep into your heart, into your mind. And when you go through struggles this week, which you will, all of us will, you just begin praising the Lord. You begin quoting Scripture. You begin singing whatever praise song you know. You sing Amazing Grace, How Sweet the Sound. Until the devil leaves. You sing victory in Jesus. You sing the goodness of God until Satan leaves. You sing I raise a hallelujah until Satan leaves. You just keep on singing. You keep on quoting scripture. You keep on reading scripture until that sucker's gone. He will leave you alone. If you draw near to God and you resist him, he's got to go. That's what the word says.